have this snack that I make all the time, and I wanted to know how many calories they have. We're used to seeing these numbers that tell us how much fuel we get from different foods, but how do they know how many calories are in there? And I think this is a question that a lot of people think they already know the answer to. Yeah, definitely. When we started talking about this subject, I was like, oh, I'm pretty sure they just put it in a special oven and burn it and see how much energy comes out. No! And that's not it. <laughs> Is what you're saying. Well, it turns out they don't really do that. Okay. So what do they do? How do they figure it out? I want to take a second to try to strip away all of the associations that we have attached to calories and think about what a calorie really is. It's a unit of energy. Energy that's stored in the bonds between the atoms and molecules that make up the macronutrients that make up our food. And if we want to know how much energy, we can light it on fire in the presence of oxygen, surround the fire with water, and measure how much that water heats up. That's what a bomb calorimeter does. And the calorie, with a capital C, which is technically a kilocalorie, is the amount of heat energy that it takes to raise the temperature of the water by one degree. Multiply that heat by a couple thousand, and you get a sense of how much energy our bodies use every day to move around, grow cells, have thoughts, fight off microbes, keep the heart beating, the lungs breathing, and all the rest. All powered by oxygen, meeting up with food. That chemistry is not too different from how a fire releases energy from wood, but of course our bodies are a bit more complicated than that. A bomb calorimeter can tell us how much energy is stored in that food sample, but this is the key thing, and I did not realize this until I was researching it. The calorie number on the nutrition facts label isn't supposed to tell us the total amount of energy in the food. It's supposed to show mm. the amount of energy that our bodies get from the food. And so to get an accurate mm. count, you really have to measure the food energy that our bodies are not using. So the, the amount of energy that's wasted or excreted. Right. Okay. So we're talking poop. Poop and pee. Okay. Wow. All right. So this is already getting a lot more messy than, than I had previously supposed. So they don't do that. It's not practical to do those kinds of studies. We will come back to human waste later in this story, but uh, for now, I'll explain what the food companies do instead. This episode is sponsored by Storyblocks. What is that? This is a new thing to me. Yeah. So the whole deal with Storyblocks is that Instead of being a stock library where you p you pick out a clip and buy it, it mm. you pay a subscription and then you get unlimited downloads. It incentivizes them to be useful to you for the long term rather than just like getting you to buy one really expensive clip. So they sort of are constantly curating and filling up this library with new things. And they have like all of that glossy, you know, slow-mo footage and the drone stuff. They have all of that, but they also have templates for all of these editing softwares, including After Effects. So one of the things I use uh. is a text animation preset. I have been thinking like, I need to get more into like downloading After Effects presets just to like, cause every time I'm starting out from scratch. Yeah, they also have like backgrounds, textures, they actually have sound effects and also music. Thanks Storyblocks. <laughs> we have a URL. Oh yeah, our yeah, first yeah. Our first URL, which is storyblocks.com slash Howtown. You don't have to remember that because we will put the link in the description. And that is where you go if you want to get started with unlimited stock media downloads at one set price. Nice. So all that food companies actually need to get their nutrition facts is a recipe. Three ripe bananas. One third cup canola one oil. One teaspoon vanilla two extract. Cups quick cooking rolled oats. One half cup dark chocolate One chips. half cup dried cherries. One half cup chopped roasted almonds. That recipe just goes into some software. I use a site called Recipal, and out comes a label. So I have this very simple banana oatmeal cookie. It's, it's we really can't call it a cookie. It's like a it's like a breakfast blob thing. And I used your service to create a nutrition facts label for it. And it told me that if I eat four of these oat blobs, it gives me around 520 calories of energy. And my question for you is, how do you come up with that number? Yeah, so each of those ingredients are uh, like entries in our database. And most of that, like those two checkmark ingredients are getting pulled from the, the USDA. And it's not your specific banana, but it's like, a banana. <laughs> uh, reference banana. Yeah. They have thousands of reference, like standard ingredients that people use in everyday life. And um, they've kind of been collecting and sampling and testing them over time to create like a pretty 
useful kind of public good in this nutrition database. So if Recipal's numbers come from nutrition databases, then we need to find out where the numbers in nutrition databases come from. We can search through some of those databases on the website of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. For each food, they list the vitamins and minerals determined through lab testing. That's what analytical means. But when you scroll up to find the calories, it says it doesn't come from lab testing. Instead, it says calculated. And in the documentation, the USDA explains that a lot of the calorie numbers are, quote, calculated using the Atwater general factors of 4, 9, and 4 for protein, fat, and carbohydrates. All right, what does that mean? Protein, fat, and carbohydrates, we learned those are the macronutrients. That's where we get the energy from our food. And 4, 9, and 4 are the calorie values for a gram of each of those macronutrients. So if a banana has 22 grams of carbohydrates, you multiply that times 4, multiply each gram of fat by 9, and each gram of protein by 4, and you get a total for each ingredient. Then add those up to get a total for your recipe. Most articles online would just leave it at that, but since this is Howtown, I'm sorry, we do have to figure out how they came up with four, nine, and four. So we have these three special numbers that food companies are using to convert the macronutrients of their products into calories. Uh, where did these numbers come from? Well, they were devised by Wilbur Atwater in the beginning of the 20th century. What he was doing was as careful and as rigorous as could be done in the early 1900s um, with the kind of equipment that he had available. And it's a real tribute to what a good scientist he is that his results are still being used. Wilbur Owen Atwater was an American chemist who spent four decades studying the nutrients of different foods and putting people in boxes for days to study their metabolism. He was deeply interested in what people should eat to meet their nutritional needs. Atwater was enchanted by how the law of conservation of energy applied to our bodies. And he had a kind of spiritual way of writing about food. And I would love to read you a passage. Yeah, I'd love to hear it. He wrote this in 1887. I often think that the greatest creation of human genius is the medieval cathedral. If this be so, the power that lifted the stones of the cathedral into their places, the thought that planned its architecture and composed its music, the emotions and the voice of those who bend and who in responsive adoration express the sentiments of its worship are all in one way or another the products of that energy which once existed in space, rested for eons in the central orb of our system, and part of which, coming to us in those things which we designate as food, abides for a time in our own bodies and our own brains to give us life and power and thought. Wow. I definitely screenshotted this passage so I can use it as an excuse when I want to go to Taco Bell. <laughs> I mean, I really like this. I think this is, I actually sometimes think about food this way of like, oh, you know, every plant we see is just sort of storing the energy that comes from the sun. And so when you eat a bit of a plant, you're sort of like, getting this delayed release of sunlight that's like powering your body. I mean, it's very cool. And I, it's and very I'm, cool. I'm very on board with this nutritionist poet guy. Yeah, this is the guy whose methods are enshrined in our nutrition facts labels because he's the one who came up with these calorie conversion factors. Atwater's real goal in all of this wasn't nutrition labels. It was to learn how much energy people were getting from their diets so he could measure what their diets were made out of, how much protein, fat, and carbohydrates. That comes from a standard set of lab tests called proximate analysis, which I'm not gonna explain, but I'll put a link in the sources if you want to learn more. What they didn't know was how much energy we get from each of those macronutrients. Now, most foods contain a mix of the macronutrients, but there are some, like lean beef, butter, and sugar, that are composed almost entirely of either protein, fat, or carbohydrates. They put those in the bomb calorimeter, and they got a starting point for the calories. But remember, they needed to adjust those numbers to account for the waste. What did Atwater need to do in order to figure out not just how much energy was in fat and protein and carbohydrates, but how much energy our bodies can actually get out of those nutrients? The problem with bomb calorimeters is that they burn foods to completion, but that's not what happens in the body. So you have to get a fudge factor that's going to account for that kind of thing. And there are a number of fudge factors that are involved in all of these things because some foods are more digestible than others and that has to be accounted for. 
It's kind of incredible that Dr. Nessel said fudge factors because we are returning to the poop stuff now. So Atwater would bring people into his lab and feed them a bit of lamp black, which is a carbon pigment, followed by a diet that had been measured for its macronutrients. And over the course of a few days, he'd collect all of their waste, starting with the black marker, and then by testing the poop for leftover macronutrients, they found that in general, we don't digest 8% of the protein we eat, 5% of the fat, and 3% of the carbohydrates. They also measured the energy from protein that we excrete through urine and estimated the loss at 1.25 calories per gram. And you take all of those fudge factors and adjust the gross energy of the macronutrients and you end up with four, 8.9, and four. Over time, the factor for fat was rounded up to nine. So those values were convenient because they were whole numbers. Everybody could use them. They multiplied easily. Um, and they've held up pretty well as approximations. If you look at the table where Atwater published these conversion factors in 1899, the title refers to nutrients in a mixed diet. It's not clear if you ever thought that they should be used to calculate the calories of individual food products the way we do today. And he had weighed those factors based on what people were eating in like 1902. While I do like ginger snaps as much as the next guy, it does seem like the entire produce aisle is missing. The Atwater General Factors say we get 9 calories for every gram of fat, and that's true if the fat is from meat, but if it's from vegetable oil, it's actually 8.84. The general factor for protein is 4 calories per gram, but if the protein is from eggs, it's 4.4, and if the protein is from brown rice, it's 3.4. The Atwater factors tend to overestimate the energy we get from plant-based foods. These numbers are from a USDA report in 1955, which reviewed all of the data from Atwater and from the 50 years after Atwater's work, and provided these more specific conversion factors for a subset of foods. So those nutrition databases we saw will sometimes provide estimates based on the general factors and also on the more specific factors. The food companies can use either one for their labels. For my oat blobs, Recipal used the specific factors, but even those can misrepresent the true value sometimes because they're averaging some big categories of foods. And one consequence of that is our calorie labels are pretty inaccurate when it comes to certain nuts. There was a study where they basically revisited some of Atwater's methods. They started with a, a brilliant blue dye capsule this time, and they were given a base diet and then they introduced a certain amount of almonds. Had them collect all of their poop in a cooler, collect all of their pee, and what these researchers concluded was that the Atwater factors overstate the energy we get from almonds and walnuts by about 20%. This study was funded by the nut industry, so. It seems like that could go either way. If I was funding a, a nut study, if I was a big nut, oh boy. <laughs> If I was, you know, the nut industry, I'm not sure if I would want it to be discovered that nuts had less calories or more calories. I don't know. I don't, I'm don't. i not sure if... It all depends on sort of what you need. And Marian Nessel, who's the nutritionist and, and molecular biologist who I spoke to, says that there's, you know, lots of ways that these calorie counts could be more precise and accurate, but she thinks that they're just, they're good enough. Why do you need it to be more accurate? Um, what's the difference? between 90 and 100 calories, I would say nothing really, which is why I think this is a, you know, this, this exercise about the number of calories in foods is not very helpful because in order to know exactly what you're eating, you would have to know every single ingredient that's in your food. You'd have to measure every single e ingredient in your food to the nearest milligram, probably. All you can do is make ballpark guesses. There's so much variability in like portion sizes. You know, if you're trying to do precise math with your food, I feel like there's so many ways that that could get messed up in either direction, just in little ways. The general takeaway on the calorie counts from the nutrition facts is that you know, there's no testing required, there's no approval in advance, they allow a 20% error, and if you've noticed, they're rounded to the nearest 10 if it's above 50 calories, rounded to the nearest 5 if they're below 50 calories, and that just reflects that, you know, we don't want to put a false precision on this number. It's a general estimate based on research subjects who were, you know, studied 100 years ago. They pooped so that we can count. Thanks, poopers. Thanks, poopers. There's more on our Patreon. 
So something that I didn't talk about in the video, the calories video, is alcohol. There are calories mm -hmm. in alcohol, um, but typically mm -hmm. they're not disclosed through a label. But there's like there's big news on this. Ireland is actually passing a law that's supposed to change that.